All right, so thanks, Brian. Uh, hi there, I'm John, and I'm thrilled to be speaking with you this morning or this afternoon if you happen to be with us from Europe or really, really late evening if you're here uh, from Asia or Australia. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, we are super excited to talk about our newest product for robotics, the Rovi 4VM module and development kit. We really think this is a great solution to bring down costs for robotic systems. So just a quick introduction for TechNection for those that may uh, not know who we are. Uh, we're an embedded solutions company headquartered in Taiwan. Uh, we've been around for over 20 years now. We have a wide range of solutions from system on modules to panel computers. And more recently, we're adding to our hardware ecosystem wireless solutions and cameras. Um, we're very, very vertically integrated. We have all of our own design, tests, QC, and manufacturing in-house. And this allows us a lot, uh, maximum flexibility around scheduling and quick manufacturing, as well as very high quality. So TechNection started in 2001, primarily as an embedded product design company, designed products custom for customers in the European market, but manufactured in Taiwan. Uh, we eventually started to build off-the-shelf system on modules, starting with uh, older ARM-based products from TI, including OMAP, DaVinci, and the first Satara MPU parts. Then we began offering our first system-level products, fanless embedded computers, as well as fanless panel computers. And over the past decade, the prevalence of wireless LAN and Bluetooth connectivity induced us to diversify our product portfolio and include wireless radios. So we designed our own radios, provide a very cost-effective, fully certified uh, solution that we populate onto most of our products. And we saw recently that many of our customers were also using our system on modules for embedded vision applications with embedded cameras. So we introduced a whole series of embedded vision solutions, including camera modules, USB cameras, and FPU and 3 cameras. And finally, to answer the needs of the robotic community, Today, we are introducing a new series of system on modules called Rovi, which is built around the Jacinto SOCs from TI. So why are we doing this? You know, we're super interested uh, in the field of robotics and the market for robotic systems is undergoing tremendous growth. Robotic systems are best suited to tasks described by the so-called four units, tasks that are dull or repetitive, such as moving boxes around a warehouse. Tasks that are dirty, such as painting, and drywall, uh, cleaning sewers. Uh, tasks that are dangerous, such as fighting fires. And finally, tasks that are now very difficult for humans to perform, such as the integrity inspection of gas pipelines, and also robotic surgery, where a robot can augment the surgeon to greatly improve patient outcomes. This market deserves solutions that can enable developers to more cost-effectively build robotic products and integrate the sorts of capabilities required for robotic workloads while also ensuring a level of safety. One of the targets, one of the largest target markets for robotic systems is warehouse automation. Um, with applications such as intro warehouse delivery, uh, personal goods, goods to person, uh, picking, et cetera, driven by shortages in labor, e-commerce, which is really driven by pre-existing trends that were catalyzed by the COVID-19 pandemic and, and other reasons. Another target growth market is agriculture, and for many of the same reasons that drive warehouse automation. Um, a decreasing workforce, an increasing population, and technological advancements that make it possible to affordably implement applications such as driverless tractors and autonomous delivery of fertilizer and nutrients. Um, other applications that are even more interesting, such as the precise delivery of pesticides and herbicides and autonomous transport of, of picked produce and, and fruits from the field, um, to the barn or the warehouse. Um, I even saw or heard about an application uh, the other day, which is a robot essentially gets pulled behind a tractor and zaps weeds um, with lasers. Uh, so very efficient laser uh, culling and also can cull um, you know, uh, over, over abundance of, of beneficial plants. So pretty cool. Um, so with all that growth, robotic systems are still very difficult to design and very expensive to develop. The main value added by the platform developer, that is the developer of the robotic platform, um, is the service the platform provides. Uh, when starting with a system design, platform developers must consider the use case of their system and then must design accordingly. 
Often these are developed using an assembly of off-the-shelf components like x86 industrial PCs, wireless network routers, USB hubs for Pamela logic controllers, and of course, sensors. Then they must integrate all of these components together in hardware and software, test them, and validate them over various expected and unexpected conditions. Um, x86, x86 systems, PCs, are the leading component in a robotic system. And not only are they very not very power efficient, but they are also cost a lot of money, especially if you are working in an elevated temperature range, like industrial temperature range. Um, and you have to add a lot of components around them in order to make them, uh, in order to make a functional robotic system. And when I talk about components, what I mean is items like cellular radios, wireless routers, safety PLCs, not to mention adapters for various interfaces that are not natively supported in, in x86 systems, but can be extensively utilized in robotic systems such as SPI and, and CAN bus. Not to mention the cost of system integration. So when you have all of these components in the system together, you need to power them, you need to connect them together, you need to fix them into your platform. And this means increased integration costs and complexity, as well as platform size, which can be a key issue in smaller platforms like UAVs. So what are robots doing? I mean, the ultimate goal uh, is to reduce costs for the end customers, the farmer, the, the warehouse operator. In, in many applications, we are seeing a rise in robots as a service business models, they're called RAS business models, um, as the robot itself uh, doesn't add value, but the service the robot provides is what adds the value. So this means that the return on investment is absolutely key. And as systems are expensive, the expected return must also match. So when the cost of an AMR on autonomous mobile robot um, is like $20,000, including sensors, maybe even higher than that, a high, a high, high investment must be accompanied also by a corresponding return. This leads to increased downward pressure on system costs. And this is where, this is where we are trying to solve the problem. So here is an example of an IPC-based autonomous mobile robot. These kinds of robots are meant to be used on, say, flat surfaces like warehouses and hotels, and they tend to carry large workloads around a warehouse floor. Uh, they will almost always have a payload of some sort, which could include a robotic arm or a motorized lift or an entire shelving system. Um, you'll have a primary controller, which is the industrial PC, and uh, into that, you'll have vision acceleration hardware to be added. This could be connected over USB or PCI Express. For navigation, object detection, and collision avoidance, usually 3D depth cameras are used, such as the Z or the RealSense, which connect to PC over USB. Um, other sensors, such as IMU and GPSs for outdoor applications, uh, connect to the IPC through various interfaces, such as UARTs, and also have to be adapted to USB. Um, robotic systems tend to look like in-vehicle networks. To provide high-speed data connectivity to other sensors like LiDARs, additional Ethernet ports are needed, and these usually aren't provided by IPCs. And so another industrial Ethernet switch is uh, very commonly integrated into the system. A wireless LAN bridge may be connected to this, or it might be integrated into the IPC itself uh, as an M.2 card, for example. Um, communication with the drive system uh, might be over UART, Ethernet, or in some cases might even be over CAN bus. Um, one of the largest and most important elements of the system is the safety system. Um, the job of this system is basically to keep the vehicle from coming itself or others, usually by coming in too close to contact something that it shouldn't. Like running into people is a bad idea. Um, for this, an entirely separate subsystem dedicated to ensuring that the robot can detect, avoid, this from happening is required. One part of this is the sensor system. This can come in form of a functional safety compliant LIDARs or proximity detectors. Uh, these sensors detect people and other obstacles. And, and when these are detected, the LIDAR systems can send a safety zone signal, uh, which indicates that the safety violation has occurred. And or some to so some vital part of the safety system, a safety programmable logic controller or PLC. The safety PLC is a processor that operates separately from the main processing system and is responsible for, pro for processing the inputs from the various safety sensors and emergency stop switches. 
um, when a combination of inputs occurs that can indicate a safety hazard, they can hard they can directly uh, cut power off to the drive system uh, via contact or other relay type device. And this immediately will halt the vehicle. So as you can see, the robotic system based on IPC is a complex system composed of many different subsystems, which all must be integrated together. So for this, we are introducing Roby 4 vm which is our first system on module designed to bring the power of the Jacinto platform into robotic and industrial applications. This is our approach to decreasing costs and improving safety through robotic systems. And Rovi here, shown with its integrated heat spreader, we have the computing power of an IPC, a video analytics and AI acceleration, industry leading IO, including built in the Ethernet switch, and a safety processor built in the package about the size of a deck of cleaning parts. To give you an overview here of the TI TDA4 VM SOC, in case you, you're not familiar with this chip, this chip is basically a beast. Uh, at, in, it is the core processing platform for many automotive ADAS and gateway systems. The TDA4 VM has 11 different processing cores each uh, inside, each of which is suited to perform a multitude of tasks. For general purpose compute, there are two Cortex A72 cores that operate up to two gigahertz. Uh, there are three floating point DSPs, two are C66 DSPs, running it up to 1.35 gigahertz, and another C7 one uh, DSP runs up to one gigahertz. That DSP is coupled next to a specialized matrix multiply accelerator, uh, which is capable of running uh, AI models at up to eight tops. And for real-time processing tasks, there are six ARM Cortex R5Fs that run at one gigahertz, which are capable of running in lockstep pairs. Moving to the video side, it can, uh, contains hardware cores for accelerated video processing and video pre-processing up to 600 megapixels pixels per second. But I think that might be wrong. I think I might need to adjust that to 710. And as well as a motion and stereo processing. There are two MIPI CSI2 interfaces, and we have demonstrated capture of up to eight cameras simultaneously, right, using MIPI virtual channels. Um, this supports hardware video encode and decode of H.264 and H.265. It will support 265 decode at the 4K at 60 frames a second and 264 encode full HD at 60 frames per second. For display interfaces, we have primarily MIPI DSI, which we can convert to LBS, HDMI, or touch panel, uh, or a touch panel interface we call Vision. And then IO is another facet of how the TDA4 VM stands out. There is really an industry leadership here in terms of high-speed I.O. suited to robotics applications. There are four PCI Express Gen 3 interfaces, two USB 3.1 interface, and an eight-port gigabit Ethernet switch integrated into this chip. For industrial I.O., there are 10 CAN ports that we pin out. There are actually more on the device, but there are 10 that we pin out to the base board. And they support CAN A, B, and CAN FD. CAN is seeing an increased use in robotic systems due to its robustness and its flexibility, and is another key differentiator for this TDA 4 b There are six UARTs, eight I squared C ports, two I squared S ports, three SPI ports, and up to 36 dedicated I.O. And this is what we are bringing down to the baseboard uh, from the TDA 4 vm TDA 4 vm actually has uh, many more UARTs, other and more I squared C, more I squared S, and more SPI. But these are the ports that we have dedicated to bring down to the board. And now is a good time to mention the safety features of the TDA 4 vm One pair of the R5Fs, there are six of the R5Fs, but one pair of these are located in an isolated MCU subsystem, which is powered independently by the power management system and has its own set of IO and peripherals and is capable capable of performing safety critical tasks. And here I show the peripherals in an orange color that are dedicated to this MCU subsystem. The MCU boots from it also from a dedicated OctoSpy flash. We will support on the module a full industrial temperature range, so up minus 40 to plus 85 degrees C. And we expect to have samples available of this module Q2 or Q2. 
So here, uh, John, I was just going to say, in the interest of, of interrupting and asking questions, uh, yeah. so on the previous slide, I noticed that the, and you mentioned it, that the MCU uh, features, safety features, um, or even fast boot like OSPI Flash are highlighted in orange. But when you were showing the robotics um, architecture, that orange was symbolizing things that would ideally be integrated in the IPC. Is that what the, the orange color meant a couple slides back? Um, let me look back. I'm not sure. No, these are just large elements ah, um, okay. Okay. In, the, uh, an... in, the, uh, in the system. Interesting um, but... coincidence that a lot of them are in the SOC. Yes. <laughs> yes. Interesting coincidence. Yes. Yeah. Ryan, you're stealing my thunder, brother. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely get to that. Um, so yeah, because what I want to show is essentially how we will uh, we will help integrate all of these things into one small package, all right? So just to give you a quick landscape uh, overview of the the SO, of the SOM itself. So here we have the SOC. Um, to that we have two different PMIX. Um, we also have our baseboard connectors. These are two uh, 240 pin Santec C ray connectors. So 480 pins from the from the SOM to the baseboard. Uh, we have uh, our Aquaspy flash here, which is uh, how uh, the primary boot uh, media for the processor. Um, then we have secure elements integrated. Uh, we have up to four, uh, up to eight gigabytes of LPDDR4. Uh, that's right here. And then um, for mass storage, we have the UFS flash load. So um, what we can achieve with a robotic controller based on Roe V4VM is a greatly simplified system. So this is the this is the thunder that Brian stole just a little while. Um, Roe V4VM designed into a custom baseboard comprises the entire compute system of a robotic product. The vision connectivity is there with very low latency link to camera systems using Nuki CSI2, um, direct access to USB many CAN bus ports and serial ports for communication, and up to eight ports of gigabit Ethernet, and the MCU subsystem for safety processing. So yeah, Brian, the thing that I was, uh, the thing that we, I think you were referring to is we can take this safety zone signals, we can take the e-stops, um, the safety shutoff, essentially all of the safety IO, we can wire those into the MCU for sort of extrinsic safety processing, processing of, of external uh, devices outside of Rovi. There's also internal safety processing. Which yeah, I was going to say internal faults. There's a, a great question in the chat, and I think this, to some extent, this slide covers some of the typical safety features in the application. And I think the the safety features implemented in the SOC are maybe a little bit less interesting, but typically required, like voltage monitoring. Um, you know. Secure boot, but also um, shutting down the application processor, keeping the MCU running, uh, having that real time control. And some of those are highlighted here, like the, the wake from CAN, but maybe you can walk through some of those application specific, like how would it actually operate um, in a robotics environment, like you're about to run into somebody or something, uh, or a, a fault occurs. Yeah, I mean, you know, so a fault would be, so you kind of differentiate between sort of intrinsic. Um, safety monitoring and extrinsic safety monitoring. So intrinsic safety monitoring is what you were referring to before, right? Is, is where uh, because of the way the TDA4 VM was designed, um, it was designed for these automotive applications where uh, safety certification is an absolute requirement. There is uh, a, a number of ways that, it, that the that the SOM can monitor itself, right? Bolts, drills, um, a lockstep pair uh, operation with the Cortex uh, R5S. But for extrinsic safety monitoring, because the safety processor can be uh, isolated in the, the, the isolated MCU island, the safety MCU island, um, that uh, can be connected to sensors that can provide sort of a prioritized safety zone signal, as well as e-stops, for example. Um, I think you also mentioned can, can wake. Um, that can also be into the isolated MCU subsystem which, like I said before, operates completely independently of the main SOC uh, CPU complex. 
So uh, that can run code to monitor um, the state of these of these signals, and then can actually send safety shutoff signals to sort of emergency uh, shut off the drive system. Does that give you an example? It gives me an example. I don't know if if it answers Does it answer the question. Oh, yeah, the answer is yes. That helps. I'm sure we can get into a lot more detail on that. Um, maybe in the the extended Q and A. Yeah. Right. So here's a, a simpler view of Roby used to build a compact and high performance robotic system. You know, at the top is the Roby SOM. Um, this is plugged into a custom baseboard, which really breaks out all of the I/O required for the robotic platform. Um, it's possible to connect up to eight cameras into the Roby 4 VM uh, using what we call Vision Link, which is based on FPD Link 3 from TI. Um, we have many different PCI Express interfaces that allow you to integrate various wireless radios and NVMe storage. Um, that can also be used to talk directly to an FPGA or some other high performance, uh, you know, silicon IC. Um, there are eight gigabit Ethernet ports that can be designed onto the board, um, utilizing the built-in gigabit Ethernet switch in the TDA4 VM. Um, we can communicate with uh, the files on the baseboard using QSGMII or SGMII. Um, you can add USB hubs to the design, allow you easily fan out and bring in, uh, bring in multiple USB 3.0 or 3.1 devices, uh, such as uh, 3D TOF cameras or stereo depth cameras. Uh, some applications use touch panel display for user interaction. And just to give you an example of this, um, so in warehouse automation, some warehouse automation platforms, they're essentially a robot running around with a display way up high. Um, the cases that I've seen, these are just Apple iPads. Um, they run a, a UI app that tells humans uh, in the warehouse which items to pick. So there's a list. Uh, the human goes out, picks the items off the shelves. The humans stationed around the warehouse in different places. Um, the, the robot goes to them, tells them what items to pick. The humans pick the items, put them in the bin, and they hit a button, and the robot just finds its way to its next location or uh, goes to the sort of outbound processing and packaging um, area. So the human picks all the items and uh, interacts with the robot using this user interface. Well, we don't need an iPad for that. We can actually uh, provide a, a, a display, it can be located up to 15 meters away using what we call vision panel, vision link panel, um, uh, based on FPV. So we have a single cable that can provide power video and bi-directional data over two twisted pores. And we leverage the MIPI DSI interface on the TV 4 vm to do that. Um, most robots have payloads. So having connectivity from Rovi allows you to easily use I2C, UARTs, CAN buses, uh, and each interfaces to, to enable communication with your payloads, so robotic arms, um, lifts, and, and other things. Um, up to 36 dedicated GPIO from Rovi can be used to control uh, or receive signals from external encoders and other devices like e-stop switches. CAN can be used to directly enable bidirectional communication with the entire drive system. Um, and at the bottom, we show how a power management and drive control board, which you would design according to your requirements for your platform, um, battery chemistry, drive system, and so on, can be built to plug directly into the I.O. breakout, um, creating a very compact and robotic system. Now, a simpler system could be useful in a UAV or a commercial drone. So in this case, the IO breakout could include a flight management unit uh, or FMU and IMU. Um, the Ruby 4 VM can process the camera video data for localization and object avoidance. And in many cases, CAN buses can provide uh, direct bi-directional communications with electronic speed controllers it would also be possible, essentially, to run the FMU, uh, which is generally run in a dedicated microcontroller. Um, that could potentially run uh, in the onboard microcontrollers in the TDA for VM, uh, creating an even more compact and integrated system. Uh, and in that case, the main processing system effectively becomes what's called a companion computer uh, in many of the commercial flight mode. Yeah, I don't think you can overstate enough the benefit of the simplicity of the, the Vision Link camera system, right? Uh, having that expandable um, FPD Link based 
system. Uh, I think in the, the main slide, we can refer back to it at a later time, but yeah, you have up to eight cameras uh, shown with those two expanders, and then you actually have a third slot available um, so that it's future proof. And then the display panel, I mean, it, you can ask anyone how difficult it would be to just get a DSI panel up and running and having that flexibility out of the box is, is really key uh, when that HMI is needed. Yeah, so so with that, Brian, you know, we really have homogenized the display interface um, for, uh, for, you know, around MIPI DSI, but we take that and we make that into something using FD83 that we can connect anything from a five to a 21 inch um, LCD panel to. And that panel is a touch panel. If you don't use, uh, if you if you need a remote uh, display, you would have to have an HDMI or embedded display port, um, and then you'd have to have some other interface for bringing the touch interface back to the processor. Um, usually, that's USB, but uh, that's you know, and then you have to have a third cable for for uh, providing power to the display. Um, so in this case, we control the power, we control the data. We have a bi-directional communication link, um, allowing us to create a touch panel that is remoted, remotely located away from the host processor. Um, and likewise, you know, the Vision Link cameras allow you to place these things all around the vehicle, bring it all back to one host controller, i.e. the Rovi 4 VM, um, for processing over one uh, coaxial cable. So, um, I mentioned that the Rovi is a family of products, uh, and I want to also say that that is a that is the first in a series of modules, and we are moving ahead quickly. Um, the next Rovi module will be available later this year, and will have multiple performance improvements while retaining PIO and safety capabilities. So we anticipate four times more general compute, uh, four times more AI processing, uh, four times more RAM, four times more width in terms of access to the RAM, so going from 32 to 128 bits, um, an additional MIPI CSI2 port, four-lane PCI Express, and an additional MIPI DSI display port. So stay tuned for that. This is just your intuition based on what the, the Rovi Next might look like. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think that's the benefit, right, of having um, partners in in the ecosystem, right, that that understand what the market needs, have a, a the ability to look at what our roadmap is uh, and plan ahead, right. And so, yeah, I mean, it's clear that this is not just some made up concept project. Uh, so, if if anyone is attending Embedded World, I think you'll get to see a little bit more detail on on where the, the portfolio is headed and how John has, has planned for that to be expandable. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Brian. Yeah, so yeah. So if you're coming to Embedded World, please do visit uh, and we can show you what's coming. So let's talk a little bit about safety features. Um, because we designed this module with the TDA4 VM SOC, as well as the power management system built around it, we take advantage of the, C, the key safety capabilities. So. The first is that TI has designed the SOC to be certifiable um, to SIL 3 with mixed criticality, which means that the isolated MCU subsystem, power management system can be SIL 3, while the main processing system is SIL 2. It's very important to recognize here that all the safety critical internal memories that incorporate inline ECC, as well as uh, LPDDR4. Um, so, in addition, there are built-in hardware diagnostics and software diagnostic libraries to handle fault coverage. Um, the isolated MCU sus subsystem is independently powered and has its own boot flash, is able to operate in lockstep, and has its own dedicated set of peripherals because it is, you know, because it is independent, it can operate as a safety processor. And finally, the power management system on Ruby 4 vm is certifiable, certifiable to sell through. All power rails are actively monitored for over voltage, over current conditions, and the input supply is also monitored and protected. So how to get started? Well, here's the first glimpse overview of our Rovi EVM. So this is the baseboard, the main evaluation board we are going to, to uh, sell for the Rovi 4VM and its successors. To get started, you need a development kit. So you can evaluate the capabilities of the Rovi 4VM, start to build your own platform. 
The Rovi EVM is designed to break out all of the I.O. from the Rovi 4 VM and, and then some. Remember, we designed it for the future. Um, here you see the Rovi module in the middle. Um, it will normally be covered by its integrated heat spreader, heat sink. Um, here you see uh, uh, we can connect eight different Vision Link cameras into the Rovi EVM using our Vision Link adapters. Um, there is a Vision Link panel adapter up top for connecting a touch panel display. Uh, we have a M.2 port on the top and one on the bottom, uh, for which I'll show in the next slide. We can that can be used um, with our network expansion adapters, so uh, which can provide up to eight ports of gigabit Ethernet each. And of course, we will have USB Type A ports, um, USB Type C port, which is very useful for loading firmware and other or using as a simple OTG port. Um, there is a dedicated MCU Ethernet port, um, which is also, FYI, can be used by the main compute complex as well. Um, there is a micro USB connector uh, integrated with our quad USB UART chip with a quad USB UART chip. So that allows a very easy way to access key serial ports in the device for debugging. So we have uh, and then also we have uh, two of the UARTs uh, can be selected to uh, drive to this RS-232 RS-45 UART connector. Um, we have an audio codec on the board to provide a bidirectional audio, so stereo line in, stereo line out. And then we have also six CAN connectors, um, as well as the main MCU and uh, GPI IO expansion connectors, the main MCU IO expansion connectors. Um, now let's take a look at the bottom. Oh, and finally, we have a wide voltage DC power supply. Um, so from 8 to 36 volts in, uh, and we have this uh, reset switches in here. We also have a JTAG trace port and a micro SD card slot. Um, so by default, we'll support two primary ways, well, three primary ways. Of, of booting Rovi. Um, one will be a primary boot mechanism using onboard storage is OctoSpy with UFS used for storing um, the root file system um, and other file systems for Linux. Uh, we also support boot from micro SD cards um, and we will support boot on USB 3.0. We have an EMMC on the board uh, as well because we bring one of the we bring the EMMC interface down so that can be used for storage or testing the MMC devices. So you have lots of different ways. And on the bottom, which we'll see, we have a boot mode switch, which allows a very easy way uh, using just little, little bit switches to configure the boot mode for the device. So here's the bottom. And the bottom has all of our PCI Express expansion. There are three M.2 slots here. Um, there's a key E slot for Wi-Fi. Uh, that's really intended for Wi-Fi. I mean, obviously, this can be used for other things, but that key E slot is mainly be used for Wi-Fi. A key B slot here, uh, which is primarily used for cellular. Um, there's a key M slot here on the bottom, and there's also one on the top that are kind of special. Um, the key M slot can be used to connect to NVMe cards, so off-the-shelf uh, NVMe storage cards, but it also can be used to connect our customized um, Quad US uh, quad gigabit Ethernet boards, so we can just plug that right in there. We change SERTA settings, and you have a gigabit Ethernet as well down in there. So you can bring eight total gigabit Ethernet ports out of Rovi for VM as well. Um, also on the bottom, we have CAN bus ports. Now these are using real CAN bus transceivers with onboard selectable ter termination. Um, so we have those there. Uh, we have six other CAN bus ports here that are just pinned to 3.3 volt IO, uh, and we will be offering a later time CAN bus adapter um, that we can bring out uh, to enable more CAN bus ports. And then we have this nano SIM slot that is pinned out to this PD interface here for the, uh, for the side of the radio. So adding cameras and displays is very simple um, for the Rovi 4VM and the Rovi EVM. Um, so when you order the kit, it will be, you can select different options for displays and cameras. So we can connect the vision link cameras, which use these chakra inputs, allow you to connect cameras to up to 15 meters away from the board if you want. Um, you can directly connect cameras. So we have camera modules that will plug directly onto the board. 
Um, we have uh, HDMI capture uh, interfaces uh, that we will have available. Um, and then on the display side, we have vision panel, which as we mentioned before, is a way to connect a touch panel display up to 15 meters away from the actual, uh, from the, from the real uh, VM post on board. So it allows you to connect you know, user interfaces some distance away using one uh, essentially a shielded twisted pair of cable. And then we have a monitor input, so we can swap MIPI BSI for HDMI. And then we also have touch panel clips that we will have available. So um, very interesting uh, for most people is how to get started with software development. So the Rovi EVM will come preloaded with uh, what we call the Tech Connection software loader. Um, this is a way that we can easily install runtime images from the cloud. So once booted, you can select what image you want to download, whether it's a Yocto-based one or whether it's a Debian-based one, um, and that will download, install, and then once you reboot that, your board uh, will have that image working. So just easily get up and in. So as far as our operating system support, um, we will have two main uh, distributions. We'll have one uh, for Yocto, uh, which is used for, which we primarily use for main platform development efforts. Because TI primarily uses Yocto, we can fold uh, changes to their recent SDKs and we'll have much more frequent releases uh, using Yocto. We'll also offer Debian images, which will come pre-integrated pre with key applications and frameworks, such as ROS2, um, as well as TI-optimized hardware acceleration. And we'll have less frequent releases on I'm gonna stop you there, John, really quickly. And uh, if you don't mind me stealing the share here, I was just gonna jump to the last slide sure. so that we can get to kind of the, the ideal stopping point and then we'll stop the recording and get into some of the details on availability and ordering uh, just so whatever Whatever we say about the availability and ordering, obviously you follow up with John or someone in the TechNection team, stay up to date here. Um, maybe you can add some some details on how a, a customer would get started. And then, like I said, we'll, we'll stop the recording, go through some uh, availability and early pricing information. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, so so for this, uh, Brian, you're mentioning here, um, to stay up to date on, on Roby progress and announcements, um, we have on our main website, just scroll down, we have a way for you to sign up for our mailing list. Um, and then from that, we will, we will send out information when, like, for example, we have sample availability, when notes are released, when new software are released, um, and that kind of thing. So to stay up to date on Rovi, uh, please do uh, reach out to us um, via our mailing list. Um, and then also, uh, and I'll go into that in a little bit, in a, in a little bit, Brian, I want to share uh, a couple of slides here on, on, uh, you know, how to, uh, on the status of the sample availability. So, um, if we want to go ahead and, and, uh, so Brian, do we want to switch? Yeah, so I'm going to, I'm just going to stop the recording here and then we'll, we'll continue, uh, for anyone that has attended the live event. Okay. For more information subscribe to our YouTube channel and check our website or reach out to us directly by contacting sales at Thanks.